project of expanding autonomy in the built environment is an old one, anchored in the idea that control over an individual's immediate environment by the individuals themselves is a fundamental good. Much has been said about the practical reasons for such an expansion, that it would lead to more apt, individualized solutions to design problems, that it would collapse project delivery times and eliminate waste by localizing solutions, that it would promote innovation by pluralizing problem solving. Equally significant but more difficult to articulate are the positive effects that such an expansion seems to have on human well-being, on the flourishing of spirit. An apparently grounded set of concerns about tools, materials, and material processes is found to be entangled with metaphysical questions about the nature of an individual's existence as a free self-defining actor and about the ethical duties that humans have to shape these apparently value-neutral technologies to best serve both individual human spirit and collective well-being simultaneously. For most people, it seems clear that the users of any piece of design should be able to choose to exercise as much control as possible over how it is put to use. They should be able to refurnish as they see fit, alter factory settings, designate what programs will occupy what spaces and when. This limited autonomy over use presupposes that the user takes control only after the object of design has been produced. In such designs, a higher order, typically one made up entirely of professional designers and builders, is charged with conceiving of the design, specifying how it will be made and doing the vast majority of the labor required to manifest it. While most good designers today go to some effort to preserve autonomy over use for future users, a greater horizon in the expansion of autonomy comes when we consider handing over to users the higher level authority that is still held by the professional class. That is, when the average person is given the authority not only to determine how a finished design is used, but how the design itself manifests, its conception and its production. In the last few decades, greater efforts have been made to engage the average users of our built environment in the process of conceiving or designing their own environment. What remains to be accomplished is the full transmission of autonomy over production to the users themselves. Contemporary sociologists and psychologists have made us aware of the extent to which our direct physical involvement in the making of our world, not just our abstract control over it, is a key source of meaning and belonging. Study after study shows that the meaning of an object or an environment holds for its end user is greatly enhanced by their direct involvement in its manufacture, leading them to treat the built environment with more care and to invest themselves in its longevity. For this reason, advocates of autonomy in the built environment have increasingly become concerned with its expansion over the physical production of spaces, landscapes, and things. We will not be able to achieve this full autonomy for users until we retool production itself to favor what Ivan Illich calls convivial tools. Those that work with, not just for society, assisting tool users in the discovery of their own best ends rather than presupposing them. Such convivial tools are only now becoming accessible to a critical mass of humanity for the first time. This radical expansion of autonomy is made possible by the advent of digital manufacturing. Before we arrive there, we need to better understand what came before. Our society has, at present, a widespread collective anxiety over the de-skilling of production jobs, from auto plants to construction sites to craft furniture shops. This anxiety is born of the notion that we are all diminished, practically and spiritually, by the increasing proportion of production tasks once performed by a class of skilled laborers, but now realized by a range of intelligent digital production systems. Such fears about the replacement of skilled human labor by non-human devices have been around since the earliest days of industrial production. By 1800, theorists of beauty and labor alike were bemoaning the loss of meaning and individual expression present in pre-industrial so-called handwork, and with it, the presence of the human spirit in the built environment. In their formulation, those things made by skilled labor serve as sites for human self-manifestation, 
self-reflection, and communication of the self to others, the forms of self-expression necessary to the well-being of all humans. Thinkers from Ruskin to Palasma have seen and celebrated the expressed human selfhood of the maker in craft-made objects, metaphorically concentrating the force of this expression in the human hand. In contrast with the products of handwork, critics see a subversion of the human worker's self-expressive drive in industrial processes. The products of industry are seen as spirit-denying in their demands upon labor and soulless in their finished expression. The denial is twofold. First, industrial machines follow a preconceived program determined by a small class of designer programmers, thereby taking away from the tool operator any ability to input their own conception. Second, machines subsume the techne, the skill and material manipulation that previously belonged only to human bodies and in working faster and never tiring, make that human skill economically inviable. Thus, human autonomy over both conception and production is subsumed by industrial machines and the few individuals who control them. What critics of the industrial frequently fail to see is that the tyranny over production present in the industrial paradigm was already present in craft work, manifest in the very symbol of that work, the hand. In pre-industrial production methodologies, this hand was, inevitably, a skilled hand, one conditioned in a rare way by experience and time to accurately execute whatever was conceived, one possessing techne. One must note, then, that the average person in pre-industrial times was no more capable of realizing their own self-expression than is the citizen of the industrialized world not because such an individual lacked the ability to conceive of their own material expressions, but because they lacked the techne, the skilled hand, to realize those expressions. Just as the seriality of industrial production centralized control over what would be made in a small class of designers, the techne through which production was possible in pre-mechanical times was owned and carefully guarded by a small class of skilled laborers. Before the industrial machine limited who could set the pattern of production, the skilled hand determined who could execute it. When we talk about de-skilling today, we are primarily referring to the transfer from man to machine of those final skills complex enough to have resisted two and a half centuries of industrialization. What threatens these skills now is the advent of so-called intelligent tools tools possessing those last bits of techne that heavy industry could never seize from human labor. Complex motor skills, informed decision-making, instantaneous response to feedback. In his seminal 2013 book, The Alphabet and the Algorithm, technologist Mario Carpo first fully articulated the ways in which these new digital tools undermine the serial logic of industrial production through their ability to produce infinite variations within a comparable time and cost framework, distributing the authority of a designer to more individuals, allowing each of us the opportunity to conceive of our own material expressions from greeting card to building. Various small, comparatively affordable CNC tools like 3D printers and multi-axis routers democratize design by wresting authority from the few individuals who presently dictate the pattern for large production runs and place it back into the myriad small workshops and home studios that dominated pre-industrial production. What Carpo and his colleagues have not fully articulated is the way that the very de-skilling these new tools seem to cause by their often uncanny expressions of advanced techne can overcome the control historically exercised by a select class of skilled laborers over fabrication for most of human history. Somewhat ironically, given its central place over the last two centuries as a symbol of more human making, the wholesale removal of the hand from production and the migration of its techne from man to machine is precisely what is facilitating this unprecedented democratization of the means of production. 
for perhaps the first time, a huge portion of humanity is able both to conceive of and execute their own material expressions autonomously, beholden neither to the production choices of industry nor the rarefied skills of craftsmen. This expansion of full autonomy to the average individual has immediate practical implications. People can now identify design problems in their own lives. They can conceive of solutions that fit their specific circumstances, and they can manifest those solutions in physical form within mere minutes, very close to home and at costs that rival or undercut the price of a solution from the market. These homemade solutions outperform most industrially produced solutions because they frame a specific problem and more directly meet that problem, both qualities that mass seriality could never attain. They also radically reduce waste by eliminating most of the environmental tolls of transportation and storage. They provide apt solutions that will be used longer and treasured more. And they produce quality goods that resist the built-in obsolescences sown by commercial producers throughout industrial goods to seed future consumption. Beyond these practical goods, the near simultaneity of conceiving and making, alongside the relative dearth of financial, ecological, and personal risk that they embody, empowers the average user to explore their world, using these new tools for discovery rather than treating them as production technologies alone. Considered in a home context, this shift in thinking would permit someone not just to generate their own version of a kitchen gadget when needed, but to iterate upon it many times in many directions in search of other latent opportunities, coming in the process to a greater understanding of their environment, their bodies, and the material processes through which the two are mediated, embedding, perhaps, human meaning in what they make, even in the absence of handcraft. Given the near-term possibility that most humans will be able to produce whatever they want relatively quickly, easily and near to home. The conversation must no longer be about man versus machine, but about man versus his own desires. We have entered the era of 3D printed shelters and of 3D printed weapons. What will it mean for everyone to be a designer and maker? It's here that I wanna to pivot towards the core topic of this symposium. It seems to me that the new production regime poses two possible near-term futures for the organization and direction of our newfound autonomy. A radically individualist one and a communitarian one. At present, it seems that the individualist future is winning, but as Illich would remind us, it is always within our power to redeploy the technologies before us in radically different ways, shifting our society in the process. When a single individual works alone in their private space to reshape their own world, they are frequently acting without any major consideration of the community that immediately surrounds them in physical space. Indeed, many of the early adopters of digital production technologies have been the same individuals that seek community remotely through the internet instead of amongst those who are physically proximate. This has led, in many cases, to the treatment of digital production technologies as tools for the manifestation of private, individuated worlds. Worlds which manifest the values and desires of one or two individuals in relative ignorance of the needs and values of the larger human communities that surround them. The choices of these individuals come to bear most heavily upon their neighbors when the objects they make transcend these private worlds and cause real harm to the larger community. The most pointed example of this in recent memory has been the rise of ghost guns. Throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, the regulations of guns has depended upon the fact that they were products of mass manufacture. The production of most firearms by a handful of firms at a few dozen facilities allowed regulatory entities to implicate manufacturers in the upkeep of regulatory systems and to accurately register each new weapon using serial numbers. On February 28th, 2022, a man entered a church in Sacramento with a rifle, killed his three young daughters and their chaperone, then killed himself. The man was known to authorities as a danger to his family. He was subject to a restraining order intended to keep him away from his wife and children following earlier threats of violence, 
and was disallowed from owning or purchasing a firearm. This meant that no legally compliant manufacturer could arm him. The gun he used to kill his daughters and upend his community was not a registered numbered firearm mass manufactured by a known entity and regulated by the government. It was a ghost gun, one made using digital production technologies by individuals actively seeking to circumvent the very regulatory mechanisms put in place to prevent a man like this from having guns. Ghost guns have no serial number, preventing authorities from ascertaining their provenance. Their key components are manufactured in small facilities, even homes, and sold disassembled by a network of small operators not beholden to the same regulations as industrial manufacturers. They are readily disassembled, reassembled with alternate parts, or destroyed, obfuscating traditional forensic technologies. Ghost guns represent the ability of a few individuals to produce material goods at will, independent of and in direct opposition to the interests and values of their communities. In 2013, one such individual, Cody Wilson, a self-described crypto-anarchist, designed, manufactured, and fired the first simple ghost gun. Wilson's weapon can be 3D printed in a matter of hours on a $200 machine the size of an office model laser printer. Since 2013, he has distributed the base manufacturing file for his gun on the internet, where it has been downloaded for free over 20,000 times and printed an untold number more. Even though his original design has been implicated in a number of murders nationally, Wilson and others have continued to design and distribute designs for ever more deadly and easy to make weapons. Faced with the ongoing threat of ghost guns and other misuses of digital production technologies, a growing number of parties have begun to call for regulation of the production technologies themselves, severely limiting who can use them and how. Though I condemn the irresponsible acts of those few individuals like Wilson, whose antisocial abuses of autonomy diminish us all, I retain an enormous faith in the unprecedented power of this new autonomy to improve human lives. Such regulation would, I think, rob humanity of the very set of capabilities that stand to transform billions of lives for the better. The answer, as I see it, comes in reframing these new tools as resources for communities rather than individuals. After all, it is in communities that humans have historically defined what is and is not acceptable behavior, what are and are not the desired outcomes of building projects. Rather than centering the distributed digital production revolution on bedroom 3D printers, I believe that we should develop an alternate model based on community workshops. These would be the site not just of individual conception and production, but of cooperative work serving shared goods. These spaces would also sponsor and host productive forums of debate and discourse, allowing communities to hash out what works best for them in real time, defining shared values through the physical modification of shared space. We might take as a starting point for such a community workshop the now common makerspace or fab lab. We see here a wonderful one I belong to in Philadelphia called NextFab. These are facilities where digital and conventional tools are held in common by a body of members, each of whom is able to use these resources to their own ends. At present, most of these facilities are organized to foster small businesses that produce and sell goods, not yet working to place the power of digital tools directly in the hands of individual conceiver makers. Still, it's not hard to imagine transmuting this model into one that serves a broader community encouraging individuals to make what they need themselves, while allowing the collective to police the borders of individuals' actions, ensuring that common resources are not being used against the community's interest. I'd introduce a second precedent into the equation alongside makerspaces, that of the storefront design studio. Here, I look to another Philadelphia organization, Tiny WPA. Though founded by two trained designers, Tiny WPA invites any and all community members, who they deem building heroes, into their space on an equal footing with the professionals, making it clear to them that they are capable of defining their own needs, 
developing their own solutions, and concretely manifesting those solutions using a variety of hand, power, and digital tools. Though the pros trained the first few teens who wandered through their door in both basic design principles and basic shop processes, members of the community now educate and support one another. Tiny WPA operates its Studio Com Community Center out of a storefront in West Philadelphia where the neighborhoods of Mantua and Powelton Village meet, anchoring themselves within a community that sees little investment from the city or from private developers, but has a long-standing tradition of DIY improvements to the built environment and mutual aid among community members. Thus situated, Tiny WPA has become more than a community workshop. It has also become a civic center where people gather for celebrations, informal debates, classes, and to assess together development proposals from the outside, giving unity and identity to the community's values. Digital production technologies housed in such a community workshop, understood as communal resources, and enveloped in a civic ethos stand, to direct, stand in direct opposition to the individualist course these technologies are now on. By redeveloping these tools and recentering ourselves around them, we will be able to leverage the new autonomy they bring to enormous individual and collective good while limiting or redirecting the actions of individual bad actors who choose to use these tools against rather than for our society. It's worth asking what role the professional designer has to play in this new model. Traditionally understood, the designer was someone responsible for conceiving of what would be built. Handing that power over to community members at large, designers remain those best equipped to shepherd projects through the workshop, assisting with every part of the process from problem setting to traditional design to manufacture and installation. The designer possesses skills not held by many in a given community. A good designer has a well-honed ability to set out design problems clearly allowing them to discover, in dialogue with community members, what the community really needs. They also have a clear picture of the network of interrelationships between physical materials and design decisions that can guide the community towards a sound conception of their design solution. Finally, most contemporary designers have an above average understanding of digital production tools, positioning them well to be teachers those who can amplify and extend their neighbor's confidence and competence in acting autonomously. This triplicate role, guide, partner, teacher, positions a community's resident designer as a kind of pastoral figure within the workshop, operating in the service of both the practical and spiritual well-being of the community. I'd like to reference here a London-based practice that I deeply respect called Zero Zero. Though initially founded as an architecture firm, they have transmuted into something akin to a design consultancy, but one emplaced in hyperlocal community maker spaces that they call impact hubs. Founder Indy Johar has called these hubs, quote, platforms to encourage autonomy, to organize micro acts which can create virtuous social, environmental, and economic cycles, end quote. Though centered on digital production technologies, Zero Zero understand these hubs more broadly as local centers for generating community autonomy within a networked and interdependent world, staffing them not just with designers and fabricators, but also economists, anthropologists, legal experts, policy thinkers, and community organizers, who are together tasked with, quote, helping people to organize themselves locally and to create institutions and organizations which are fundamentally focused on civic purpose, end quote. The network of localities and communities that is zero zero serves as a shepherd for and guarantor of the autonomy of the many, acting as a servant leader in what Johar calls the boring revolution, the one that must precipitate significant societal change before any flashier technological revolution can fully manifest. The widespread replacement of industrial production by the new digital paradigm is upon us. With it, we will see an unprecedented expansion of individuals' ability to both conceive and manifest their own unique vision of the material world. 
It is incumbent upon us as professional designers to encourage the adoption of these technologies in a pro-social way by centering them in communities rather than allowing them to serve only the isolated needs of increasingly distanced individuals. It also falls to us to accept a transition in our own roles, giving away the monopoly we have historically had on the conception of the built environment so that a greater body of our peers can dream for themselves. Our reward comes as a higher calling, to act in direct service to our communities, sitting at the heart of new processes of cooperative making as guides, facilitators, and champions of our new communally defined world.